This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeShip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically for fuss-free, continuous delivery. Check them out at CodeShip.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 183 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Avdi Grimm. Hello from Pennsylvania. Jessica Kerr. Good morning. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I'm going to give you a quick reminder. If you do JavaScript, go sign up for JS Remote Conf at jsremoteconf.com. Uh, we also have a special guest this week, and that is Ben Hammersley. Hi there. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Um, I'm a writer and a broadcaster from the UK, but based really on planes around the world. I uh, lecture around the world on the effects of technology uh, on society and, and consult for governments and the military and so on around the world. And then I, at the moment, I have a BBC TV series called, and you have to say this in a silly voice, um, it's called <clears throat> Cyber Crimes with Ben Hammersley. Exactly. Which is about the, the evil world of <clears throat> cyber crime. Uh, so there you go. We can talk about all of these things. Do you have sidekicks like Doctor Who and Sherlock? They are my bitches, yes. <laughs> Awesome. So I have two very pressing questions I have to ask before we really get going. The first one is, Is are you the one that coined the term podcast? <laughs> oh, God. This follows me everywhere I go. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. But and I'd love to say that it was some form of heroic, you know, word creation story where I, you know, I went to the top of a mountain and, you know, discussed the creation of this word with a monk and then brought it back down and, and gave it unto, it unto the universe. But Actually, the story is that I was writing about in 2004, I think it was, I was writing a story in the Guardian newspaper here in the UK about this new phenomenon of automatically downloading audio files via the medium of a specially configured RSS feed. And it was very, very close to the deadline. And my uh, copy editor said that it was a couple of sentences short. And please, could I write a couple of extra sentences? Because it was very, very, very close to the deadline and they didn't want to have to sort of pad it out themselves. And so I wrote this sort of sentence where I said something like, but what shall we call this new phenomenon? And then I made up three or four different new words. And one of those was podcast. And that was published. And then about a year later, I had an email from the Oxford English Dictionary people saying, we see you wrote this sentence. Where did you come up with the word? And I said, well, you know, too much caffeine. And <laughs> it was five minutes to go before the newspaper had to be printed. And, and they said, well, like, jolly good. You know, it's, and so it's, I didn't know. You know, I was sort of unaware. Wow, so you it's know. official. You got an email from the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> That's right. I, well, I just realized I have a new item for my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, I mean, I don't think they do that all the time. I think it was just for this particular case because it was word of the year that year. Oh, um, wow. And so, you know, I, ever since then, I've been expecting either a trophy or, you know, a, you know, a diamond encrusted iPod to arrive in the post or something <laughs> like that. But ne neither of these things happen at all, which is very sad. I can't afford a diamond-encrusted iPod, but what's your address? 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> the thing is, is if I tell anybody my address, then all of the anti-podcast people will be at this. The anti-podcast you had is quite fearsome. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't want to get doxxed by the anti-podcast anonymous. It's just, you know, they're fearsome. They're fearsome. They're, they're all real to real guys. That you know, oh, they're still mailing, the tapes, still mailing the tapes around. Yeah, you know that, and in fact, you know, people still do that. Obviously, for major amounts of data transfer, and so it's just yeah. a. It's like a cosplay version of that. It's very, very weird. But, you know, I'm scared of them, so <laughs> sorry. Just put London, you know, and it all gets me eventually. Uh, I need a, a mustache like yours, too. That was the other thing I wanted to bring up. Well, that's what you get when you invent a word, actually. It just appears overnight. Oh, is that all it takes? <laughs> it's a weird thing. That's right. That's why if you look in all those sort of old-timey pictures, they all had quite impressive facial hair. It's because at that time, there were fewer words in the dictionary, and so more people were inventing more of them. And so, you know, there's a lot more space, you know, in the world to invent new words. And so that's why they all have such impressive facial hair. You know, Dickens, massive moustache. You know, <laughs> Mark Twain, massive moustache. And it's because they just invented a lot of language. Nowadays, the dictionaries are almost full. So there's a, you know, we're, we're in the scarcity phase. So that's why you don't see quite as many impressive handlebar moustaches anymore. All right. Well, well really, I, I feel, I feel we're weaker, you know, as a race, we're weaker as a civilization. We, you know, maybe we should, you know, invent new, you know, start afresh with a new, less populous language, and then everybody can reclaim their astuteness. Well, you convinced me. I'm giving up on personal grooming. Anyway, I watched your talk. I really enjoyed it. I never really thought about those effects of Moore's Law. Mm. Yeah. So can you explain your view of Moore's Law, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there are lots of different ways of looking at Moore's Law. I think the way that, that I've said in that talk and, and many other talks I've given uh, since then is that the general populace really has a hard time understanding the exponential nature of Moore's Law, that doubling and doubling and doubling again, because we don't really have a, a way to grasp, it's sort of in common sense, we don't have a way to grasp just how big those numbers get, how quickly. So that's the first thing. And then we just don't instinctively understand it. The second thing is that we don't understand the ramifications of it. And there are two, I think there are two main ramifications. The first one is that if it already exists and it's a little bit rubbish, then Moore's law basically means it's going to be brilliant in a few years' time. So the example I give of that is, say, digital photography. You know, Kodak invented digital photography in the late 70s. It was terrible, right? You know, it was, it took photographs that looked like a chessboard. At the same time, Kodak were making Kodachrome film, which is the most beautiful transparency film in the history of the world. And so they looked at digital photography and basically dismissed it because they said, look, it's not very good. So we'll just keep making film and we'll, we won't make digital photography. And of course, the disadvantage of that is that they entirely forgot about Moore's Law. The, the idea that it, once it became possible, then simply through that accretion of processing power, then it would, it would become good enough eventually. You know, and so roughly about the same time that Kodak went bankrupt, you know, Instagram, you know, the app which takes pictures that look as if they were shot on Kodachrome film, you know, was sold for $800 million. So it's the underestimation of precisely how damaging Moore's Law can be to incumbent businesses. That's, that's the first thing. And the second one is, is related to that, which is that if we can dream it up, it's going to happen. And so we're starting to see that this year, especially with artificial intelligence, that we're seeing AIs coming onto the market, which are profoundly science fiction-y, but are available in the stores. Really? What's an example of that? Well, two things in the past couple of weeks. I mean, the Amazon Echo, for example, the, the device that Amazon started to sell uh, or announced last week, which is a, it's a household appliance, which just sort of sits in the middle of a room, and it plugs into a, a standard wall socket, and it's basically the, the Amazon equivalent of Siri or Google Now or Cortana or any of those sort of voice-activated interfaces that goes out to the cloud. It does web qu queries. I think it talks to Wolf from Alpha and things like that. But all, And then you can also ask it to do things. For, you know, you can say, put such and such a thing onto my shopping list, and it will automatically add that item to your, to your cart within Amazon. Now, that's you think about all of the different steps that that takes, you know, the natural language processing the understanding of what the question is, going out to all these different systems and finding the answers to your questions. All of that technology, that's actually that's a whole load of really quite deep AI stuff. And Amazon is selling it for $99. So, you know, we have a household AI or the beginnings of a household AI for less than 100 bucks. And again, going back to the first thing about Moore's Law, with the capability doubling every year or so, even if Amazon Echo is 
rubbish today or not as impressive as you might hope it to be today in five years time in 10 years time which is still not a long time to go we can be looking at technologies we can't possibly imagine today and and the same thing as we happen to we have today if we think about the technologies we have today and go back 10 years what didn't exist well Smartphones didn't exist, YouTube didn't exist, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist. You know, think of all of those different things that weren't around 10 years ago and how they've transformed the world. Now think of all of those things, but with an additional five or seven or eight cycles of Moore's Law, you know, 64, 128, 256 times as powerful as they are today. And, and we're starting, what we find is we can't really imagine what's going to happen. And so, that's a fundamental shift. So we put Echo in our house, which is listening all the time. And then we have things like Facebook that is such a privacy-minded company. And, you know, these things start talking to each other and have these capabilities. I mean, some of it is frightening and some of it is exciting. And I'm not sure yes. which is which I'm more of, afraid or excited. I think it's it's both of those things. And this really comes to one of the other effects of Moore's Law, which is the capability of the technology and the growth in that capability far outpaces society's ability to to transform, to deal with it. From simple things like etiquette, you know, it, it took us 20 years to know not to have your phone on in a restaurant, for example. And, and to this day, you know, many people still keep your, you know, keep their phones on in cinemas and things like that. You know, so because we, we it's taken, it takes maybe a generation for people to to learn how to deal with technologies at that very basic social level. And when we start adding in all of these, what are effectively miracle technologies, with technologies which to non-technical people are absolutely indistinguishable from magic. I mean, Amazon Echo, like you say, it's a box that sits in the corner of your room. It listens to everything you say until you, till it hears its name, and then it listens more carefully and goes out and, and, and does what you want it to do. Now, if you were to take that piece of equipment and show it to somebody who didn't understand technically how it works it's a god basically right it's utterly magical it's and alive it's a yeah and or if it's not alive then it's certainly deeply mystical right it's deeply powerful it's a crystal ball it's a shrine it's whatever you want to call right? it's it's something like that and so you can easily see how people non-technical people would be either completely freaked out by it or be utterly bewildered by it or completely bewitched by it, one of those things. And that's where you get into, we get into the, the more, what I think are the, the fundamental discussions we need to have about technology in, the, in this part of the decade, which is that all of these technologies are now becoming so ubiquitous and so powerful at the same time that they cease to be technological problems and they start to be political and social problems. Well, that's a point that you made in your talk was that our legislators don't understand the technology that we have now. And since it's moving at an exponential pace, it's moving twice as fast, you know, in a year or so as it is now and twice as fast as that a year or so later. So how do we have the conversations so that they have even a clue of what they're talking about or legislating against? Indeed. And in fact, since I gave that that original talk, I sort of changed my mind a little bit about that argument. What I was saying then was that legislators, politicians, and so on need to be educated to be brought up to speed to with the implications of these things so that they can make good choices around these things. My current view is different. I think that actually what we're seeing is the increasing irrelevancy of those existing power structures. And so it's not so much that we need to educate the politicians ar- about the technologies, it's that we need to protect society from the death throes, as it were, of those politicians or those power structures as they realize that the mon- modern technology is forcing them into a situation where they, they're no longer relevant. A particularly good example of this is the financial world. If you're the Treasury Secretary, you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer here in the UK, for example, 20 or 30 years ago, you had tools that you could play with where you could affect the economy, for example. Today, what we're realizing is because of the network, because of the technologies that are involved in the financial system, then the the finance ministers, the Treasury ministers, chancellors, all of those people, their levers are, are now floppy. They don't have 
efficacy within the systems that they used to have. And so what we're starting to see is the collapse of the modern, and certainly in Europe, we certainly see the collapse of the political system, or at least a, a crisis within the political system, not because of their lack of understanding of the technology. They probably, a lot of them probably do understand the technology. It's that the technology renders them obsolete in very subtle ways. And so it's more a matter of protecting ourselves from the counterblast to that. And certainly in Europe, we're starting to see the rise of political parties who are very much, I would call them like militantly nostalgic, that they want to roll back modernity because it's freaking them out. Because all of the things that all of the institutions that they hold dear and all of the ways of governing that they hold dear, all of the power structures within the society that they hold dear are all falling apart because of digital technologies. So this is interesting to me, and it's I feel like there's a flip side to this. I mean, I, I've spent most of my life up till now very much feeling like the new structures that the technology enables are going to sort of grow up around these old structures and, and render them re- irrelevant. And I, I saw that as a mostly positive, benign thing. But lately, I've actually started questioning that. Um, uh, we were talking a little bit before the show about how I, I started watching an interesting BBC documentary series called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, which talks a bit about the rise of the what they call the California ideology, which was the same kind of idea that like this sort of libertarian utopian techno utopian world where the new new self organizing systems would be able to completely you know obviate the need for all the old political systems and you still you see that i think more than ever in some of the st- stuff that comes out of silicon valley where there's almost a religion of disruption but often it seems like there's very little ethics that goes along with that religion of dis- of disruption and you know people just sort of plow ahead thinking that as long as you're disrupting you're doing good and a lot of times and it's starting to look like a lot of times that's not you know really necessarily the case Yes, that's right. And we're seeing some very good examples of that today, the day that we're recording this with Uber, for example. So, you know, one of the, you know, Uber, the taxi, Mm -hmm. you know, company that they allegedly last night, uh, one of the senior executives at Uber was at a dinner where he allegedly said that he was going to form a team within Uber to start doxing journalists who wrote things about, you know, that would be critical of uber for example wow and and yeah which is which is causing enormous amounts of fuss but uber themselves especially around europe are incredibly controversial in that they come into markets uh you know specific cities with disruption above all else as their mantra and the local context is always much more complex than they they necessarily seem to acknowledge and the local context or specifically around taxis has grown up for particular for certain social reasons in those certain social places and so they come across that sort of california uh, ideology comes across in places other than san francisco as being a little bit sociopathic and for many technology companies they come across as being completely sociopathic or if not sociopathic then certainly as a corporate entity somewhere on the autism spectrum (laughs) <laughs> Google used to be like this. Google's original attempts at social networking were always a little bit spectrum, right? I remember six or seven years ago when they launched, I think it was called Google Wave, maybe? Whichever one it was, one of their social network attempts. One of the big problems with social networks is that you have to, you, if, if nobody's a member of it, then it's useless. But if, if lots of people are a member of it, say like Facebook, then it suddenly becomes incredibly useful for the members. And so it becomes this, you have to get a social network up to critical mass for it to be useful. And so the thing that Google did that time was they said, well, what we'll do is we'll enroll every Gmail user into this network automatically, and we will automatically friend the top 10 most contacted people in your email inbox. And we'll let everybody see who everybody else's friends are. Ouch. <laughs> now, Ouch. Now, if you're an engineer who doesn't use a cubicle in Mountain View, then your top ten friends are your, are your top ten friends, and that seems that maybe seems an entirely reasonable thing to do. However, if you're somebody who's having an affair, if you're somebody who is running away from an abusive spouse, if you're somebody who has two groups of friends who should never really meet, oh my god, no, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Whatever human foible or just human situation that you have, then 
then that those boundaries between those people are very 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 important to you. And if you when you wake up that morning and you find that Google has em- automatically enrolled those ten people in your social network and is showing each other everybody else's friends list, then really bad real world things can happen. And that was because of this lack of understanding of the wider context of stuff within the digital network from, say, a Californian companies. Now, that lack of understanding of the wider context that technology is found within is pretty much universal. We see that you know everybody has this. Everybody sees technology through their own frame. And so companies see the technology they make through their own frame. Politicians see it through their frame. You know, every individual user sees it through their frame. And so uh, half of the debate around new technology is just a, a mismatch of context where people don't quite see that a particular technology that they use in one way might be used in a completely different way by other people under completely different circumstances. Yeah. This means that as developers, as people who create software, we have a responsibility to think about people in contexts other than ours. Yes. I mean, think about the ubiquity of the sort of technology that we're talking about. If you're a mobile developer or you're building something that sort of people access through their mobile device, then that technology is incredibly intimate and important to that person. It's carried around in their pocket. It's never more than a meter away from them at any time in their life, right? It's in their pocket. It's on the little table by the side of their bed. It's on the little shelf in their bathroom when they're having a shower, you know. So these technologies are incredibly important to people and, and have access to the most important and intimate parts of people's lives. And if you don't understand that, then you're dangerous. You're actively dangerous. You know, as a technology industry, we've spent maybe the past 15 years pointing out how cool it would be if people adopted these new technologies into their lives and made them a fundamental bit of their lives. Now, people have done that. They've adopted these technologies and made them a fundamental part of their existence. Now, with that comes, from the developer's point of view, a huge moral responsibility because you could really ruin people's lives. I mean, like genuinely ruin people's lives and not just ruin their lives, but you could get them killed. And if your instant reaction is, there's no way I could get somebody killed through a piece of software, then you're just not thinking wide enough or around enough people's lived experience that in order to, to find the way that your piece of software could get somebody killed. And so... As an industry, we need to have these discussions and we need to, and we need to kind of watch over each other to say to other developers, you know, dude, like, make sure the data you're dripping, right, doesn't get somebody into trouble or, or whatever the case may be, but reach the level of ubiquity and reach the level of capability that mistakes like this could be really, really bad. Ben, can you give an example of software that you'd never thought would get somebody killed but could? Well, I mean, any form of communications technologies. So we're talking about, you know, any form of communications technologies where you, where you might be using it to talk about things which are, which are, which become unpopular with the place that you live in. Mm. Now, in the United States and the United Kingdom and, and, you know, countries like that, you're not likely to get rounded up and shot in the back of the head for, for an email that you wrote. But if you are creating a communication system that's going to be used globally, then you are going to have users which are going to be using it in those places. This talks to a thing that happened a few weeks ago, which was the the new head of GCHQ here in in the UK, you know, GCHQ being the the British NSA, basically. There's a new guy there, and he did an essay for the Financial Times when he started his job where he said that it was disgraceful that major tech firms, uh, specifically Apple and Google, were not allowing GCHQ and NSA to access encrypted data on their devices. And specifically that it was completely unacceptable that Apple and Google were implementing crypto on their devices that even Apple and Google couldn't, you know, break because that would fundamentally uh, weaken the capability of GCHQ or NSA to fight terror, as an example. Now, in many ways, he's entirely right we have to admit that there are bad guys out there who want to kill us. And we have to admit that it is the job of those intelligence agencies to find these people and stop them from killing us. And it would be, in given you know the best possible world, probably a good idea to give them the tools that they need to do that. However, what this guy was forgetting was that the wider context is that Google and Apple make devices which are sold everywhere. And so the very same back door that would be given to GCHQ or the NSA in order to find really, really bad guys... Right? 
could be used, for example, by, say, the Chinese state police to find pro-democracy demonstrators because iPhone 6s are on sale in China. And so Apple's responsibility is not to the safety and sanctity of the US and the UK and the Western world. Apple's responsibility is the safety and sanctity of, of, of its users. And many, many millions, if not the majority of its users, will be in places where the state is actually the bad guy. And so this is a sort of an example of, of how what might be seen as a, potentially a good thing in certain circumstances, allowing for a, a judicially controlled, you know, overseen backdoor into Apple devices that given a court order and, you know, and enough oversight, the NSA could use it to find the guy who's got the ticking bomb that's going to blow up Manhattan. You know, that might be a particularly good thing to have. But having that actually endangers potentially hundreds of thousands of people who have iPhone 6s in much more dubious regimes around the world. And so we, this is because everybody is looking at these devices from a different context. That's fascinating. So the technology of software and the internet with all its new interconnections that didn't exist 20 years ago lets our inventions spread outside of our own context fantastically quickly. Yes, well, insanely quickly. And so because of that, it creates enormous complexity because it's basically impossible. What I've just asked people to do, which is try and think of the ways that your technology can be used outside your own context, is basically impossible, right? Because it requires you to have almost superhuman powers of empathy uh, and empathy into cultures that you don't, might, might not necessarily know, or even have heard of. So it really re creates an impossible situation for developers. And so that sort of... That risk is actually inherent and is increasing. And then on top of that, we have the risk of complexity of all of this stuff, which is we don't really understand as a society what happens when all these technologies themselves start interacting with themselves. And that's something that we, that we saw in the, you know, in the financial crash. And it's certainly something we're about to start seeing as more and more AIs come onto the market. That not only do we not understand each other as people, not only do we not understand how to, how other people are going to use our technologies, but we also don't understand how other technologies are going to use other technologies and what's going to happen to the people then, which is quite a complex thing to have just said. And that gets back to your definition of Moore's Law, which is about it's not just the processors. You said you use IT to invent the next generation of IT. So yeah. it's, it's not just the processors anymore. It's everything we build. That's right. And, and so that's why we're seeing this increase in complexity, which is not just the, you know, the raw power of the technology, but the sort of the interconnections of the second order effects of that technology, of, of the social effects of that technology, of the, of the decision making that comes from that technology, of the different ways that we now live because of that technology. I'm still not sure how I feel about the fact that I carry around a Jack, Cracker Jack's prize of tomorrow in my pocket today. And it's only going to get worse, right? You know, yeah. the, uh, talking about the iPhone 6 again, you know, the iPhone 6 is as powerful, I think, as a, MacBook Pro from 2008 or something like that. And it's 600, I'm, I'm trying to remember the number. I think it's like 600 times as powerful as a Pentium 75. And, and I know for a fact that the iPhone 5 was three times of a Cray 3 supercomputer, you know, the one at the end of Superman 3, right? You know, the, 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 the iconic nuclear, you know, supercomputer from the, from the end of the, the eighties, from the beginning of the eighties, sorry. You know, we, this, this thing of the amount of processing that we can carry around with us, the amount of capability, and what that can then be used for. We really, even people who are technologically very, very savvy, we really don't necessarily understand not only what is possible, but what is soon going to be very, very commonplace. Google Research this morning announced a project that they had for an artificial intelligence that can look at a photograph and in English describe what is in that photograph. So it can say, this is a picture of, and the example they have is a picture of uh, two pizzas in boxes on top of an oven in a kitchen. And they gave that JPEG to this AI, and the AI, and the AI said, it's two pizzas in, a bo in boxes open on the top of an oven in a kitchen. You know, and then there's another one, and the AI said, it's two dogs playing in a park, and things like this. Oh. Now that's super cool. Because, How fantastic but, for accessibility. <laughs> and also... Right. Think of, I mean, as much fun as Google Translate is now, think how much fun we can have with an image describer. Right. But also think of all the really bad things you can do with it, right? Let's have a, let's have a think about all of the really evil things that we could do with that. 
let's go out and get as many images as we possibly can from all of the, you know, from, from a database where there are lots of images, whether it's Flickr or, or we can crack into Snapchat or Instagram, something like that. And we say to this AI, okay, go through all of these billions of images and find me all of the naked people, right? Or find me all of the naked people that look like this person or you know, find me all the pictures of, and then whatever the thing that you want to find, right? Now, we, we can come, undoubtedly, this technology will result in all sorts of entertaining and interesting crimes. Just through blackmail, I can think of mechanizing that, right? And so, you know, so that, because that, you know, how cool would that be, right? Let's just make a bot that goes around and looks for naked selfies. And then when it finds one, emails that the you know it identifies where it came from and sends a message to it saying if you don't send this many bitcoins to this address we will post this particular thing we'll post this particular image to you know the front page of reddit or something like that now you could you could set a botnet on doing that it'd be quite easy probably be quite profitable i can think of very many ways to break the law with computers so it seems to be a talent of mine. would that be a cyber crime yes <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> dun, dun. I just had to get that word in there again. So so the the thing that's really interesting about this discussion is that where does the responsibility lie? I mean, so Google invents this technology and we can use it for good. Is it their responsibility to make sure that it doesn't get used for that? Or is it the responsibility of the people who are kind of the next level up programmers or the rest of the public? And the other question is, is I worry that we're going to hamper our own progress for fear of these kinds of things happening. Well, quite. I mean, it can't be the manufacturer's responsibility because that would mean that, for example, all car crashes were the responsibility of Ford right, or something like that. You know, at the end of the day, so much of, of Western law goes against the idea that it's Google's fault. Right. But they um, do legislate that they have to have certain safety features. That's true. That's and true. But, you know, you only really have to get into the gun debate to work out that that's never going to happen. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I, I think we have to just say that it comes down to individual responsibility. I can go into a store down the street and buy a hundred knives um, because it's a kitchenware shop, but I could then go and stab a hundred people. It, like it's in the usage that makes the tool, I think. So, mm-hmm. so we have to be, it has to come down to that. But the problem. But these tools with, are getting more and more powerful, right? Well, by, that's by right. an expo- but, exponent of two every year, year and a half. That's true. But then you have to think about it practically speaking and say, well, okay, what would a, co- a country have to do to be able to, to ban a potentially problematic technologies within its borders? And given the modern world, it would have to become North Korea. Mm-hmm. Basically, you have to become Amish, right? You either have to say, we're going to have to deal with everything or we're just going to not deal with anything and build a very big fence around your country. But if you've got the internet, you've got it all. You either have it or you don't. You can't have half the internet. Because otherwise, or certainly not in a modern democracy, you can't, you can't have half the internet. You have to have it all. And so it, it really does come down to society deciding what is acceptable and what isn't. And that's really where this stuff starts to get really, really interesting because it's not necessarily the really dangerous stuff, the stuff that will kill you that's going to be problematic. It's going to be the stuff that's socially awkward that's the most problematic. So let me give you a good example. Jawbone, you know, the, the, the fitness tracker people, right? They have a thing called the, the Jawbone 3, which comes out, I think, next month, just in time for Christmas in the US. And that has constant pulse detection. And the, the Apple Watch is going to have the same thing. And they have an API, so you'll be able to monitor your pulse all the time. Now, it would be trivial, programmatically speaking, to take the somebody's uh, pulse rate monitor track and match it against their calendar and match their calendar against LinkedIn and do a real-time feedback thing of who it is that you meet that causes your blood pressure or your pulse rate to go up. So Perfect. you could have a... Yeah, then so we you can could use have, it for online dating. Or you could use it, or you could use it for online arsehole meter, right? Because you could say, every time I meet Bob from sales, he drives me completely crazy. You know Bob from sales too? Yeah. Yeah. What what an arsehole, right? So the thing about that is you could use the sort of quantified self type idea to prove it to yourself that although you previously had this, this sort of feeling that Bob from sales was really aggravating, actually now you have the data. And then it would be a really, really trivial thing to have that being an extra field in LinkedIn 
for example, which says, you know, of the 50 people who've met Bob with sales in the past month who were wearing a Jawbone 3 or an Apple Watch or whatever, 45 of them felt an elevated pulse rate whilst they were meeting with this person. Either Bob is incredibly sexy or <laughs> he's incredibly annoying, right? Now, I mean, technologically, that's none of those things are difficult. Technology is already there, right? It's just in simple use case. And now, if we were to do that, and undoubtedly somebody will, because it seems quite, you know, it's something I made up on the back of a post-it note, one, you know, on a plane a couple of days ago. Now, if somebody does that, then we have to come to terms with the social ramifications of an additional variable of data going around the world about you, which is people's average increase or decrease in heart rate whenever they meet you. Now, what would be the social implications of that? For Bob, it's really bad, right? Well, suddenly we have new metrics by which to, to measure ourselves, and that's a whole new social thing. I mean, again, we're talking about quantified things. We're starting to see the rise of what's called the quantified office, where there are quite a few companies raising quite a lot of money at the moment to implement systems where they'll be able to quantify everything that a person does. And so there are some some companies who attempt to measure programmer productivity by the number of GitHub check-ins that they do every day. Now, obviously, anybody who has ever coded in their life would know that that's a terrible metric to measure productivity by. But that won't stop companies from doing it. And the same thing, measuring people's productivity by how many emails they send or how many like, words of documents or how many slide, PowerPoint slides they make. But these companies have been created to measure this stuff. And so we have now a social situation where people are being measured by the number of GitHub check-ins or whatever. And that creates a whole new social and political question to be asked about these technologies. In the case of stabbing someone with a knife or crashing your car into someone, we don't prohibit knives in cars outside of the airport. We instead respond by punishing the stabber after the fact. Can we do that same sort of thing for destructive activities like posting personal photos? You can to a certain extent, but it depends on the type of wound that is left, right? One thing that occurs to me, if I can just chime in for a minute, is that the people who are doing it have the same resources that we do to find them and punish them. So I think we can, but only if we can find them, only if our offense is better than their defense. Right, and that's a big problem with cyber warfare, which is what's known as the attribution problem, which is that most countries in the world who have cyber warfare capabilities are very, very worried about using it because... Once people start using the, using cyber warfare technologies, it becomes very, very dangerous because you can't s prove for certain who it was who launched the attack. And it's the same thing for, you know, anonymous or any of those sorts of low grade digital assaults, you know, that identifying who's doing it and why they're doing it is very, very difficult in the digital realm. And so we do end up with severely one sided arguments, which require perhaps, I think, a, ch a social change rather than a law enforcement change. They require it to become socially beyond the pale rather than just illegal. I think there's a, there's a fundamental difference there. It, it's the difference that we have in the UK about drink driving, you know, DUI. There was a huge social change in the past 20 years in the UK about drinking and driving. 25 years ago, for example, it was very low grade offense socially. Like nobody really cared, right? And then the government, but it had always been illegal, but the government did a, a, an advertising campaign, which was incredibly powerful. If you, if you ever want to really scare yourself silly, you know, look on YouTube for British government anti drink driving advertisements from the 1980s. But because of that advertising, it remained illegal, but it is now absolutely socially unacceptable. If you were caught you know, it's one of the things that, that separates the our two countries, which is we hear about, you know, actresses getting arrested on a DUI charge and everybody's like, ah, ha, ha, Lindsay Lohan or whatever. Whereas here in the UK, if somebody's arrested on a DUI charge, they lose their job and probably get divorced. I mean, it's like the end of their life. It's utterly unacceptable. And I think it's that sort of social change that might have to happen for certain things activities that happen online, like, say, doxing or something like that, which can't be stopped legally, can't really be stopped technologically, can only be stopped by the fact that your mother will never speak to you ever again. Yeah, I look out and I, I'm a little worried about a situation where the powers that be are, are always necessarily going to be a few decades behind, because, you know, 
to be old enough to be head of government, you sort of necessarily have to be old enough to not really get the current state of Moore's law. And then the alternative seems to be anonymous, which is not the kind of government I'm, I, I want to have. <laughs> no, indeed. I mean, I mean, the thing about anonymous is that that, I, that frustrates me is is that people seem to conflate technical capability with political understanding. It's the same thing with Occupy. Now, I might be, you know, I am in fact quite sympathetic to a lot of Occupy's, you know, political viewpoints. But the fact that Occupy or Anonymous or any of these groups are capable of using technology to express their opinion does not add merit to their opinion, and that's something that I think we need to. That's a that's a process that we need to, as a society, get through. Which is just because you're good at the internet doesn't mean you're right. Whereas at the moment it seems to be split between people who are terrible at the internet versus people who are great at the internet. And because we're also great at the internet, then we'd like to, we'll settle with the people who are great at the internet. But it, just because you're great at the internet doesn't mean you're any good. And that's a that's a real a political evolution that's going to have to happen in the next 10 years or so. Now, it's going to happen through natural accretion, which is just that the old people are going to die or certainly retire. But between now and then, we're going to go through some, I think, certainly in, in the West and, and certainly in the north of Europe, we're going to go through some quite dark patches where a lot of the sort of stuff that social change that we have seen through the internet that we think is good, it's going to get rolled back because the old people are in charge and the old people are completely freaked out by it. As a programmer, I know what to do if I need to learn about the latest technology that's coming down the pipe. I'm more in the dark when it comes to educating myself politically and, and especially ethically, you know, how to think about these ethical issues that flow out of the, the technology that we're creating. Do you have any pointers on how a programmer is to give themselves an education in the ethical side of what they're doing? There isn't really a book that you can read on how to be a good person, tragically. I think it's more a matter of just having a think about, well, two things. If I was evil, how could I use this for bad? That would be one thing. But the other thing is to think about the culture that you're embedding in the software that you're writing. And that's a really quite a subtle point, but it's, it's, and it requires an awful lot of mindfulness almost, a, a sort of introspection about it. But could it, the example that I, that I give quite a lot is around Blackberry. The Blackberry as a device is really the physical instantiation of a political and cultural belief that email is the most important thing in the universe. Right? If you take on a Blackberry, <laughs> If you're given a BlackBerry by your business, then what you're effectively doing is accepting into your world the idea that if that light starts blinking, you have to stop whatever it is you're doing and answer that email. And that's an all the entire user interface of a BlackBerry is based around that political belief. Now, they might not have interrogated themselves to understand that, but that's what that is. And so it's the same with any other um, type of technology is what are the, um, the assumptions in the design of uh, this piece of tech? What are the assumptions? And the assumptions might be, the assumption is this person has to be online at all times. Or that undercutting the price, uh, you know, uh, being in a store and finding something, that, finding that thing, but for half the price online is, is the most important thing for that person or, or whatever it is, you know. And so by interrogating the underlying cultural assumptions of the technology, then you can start to, um, to unpick it a little bit. And when you do that, when you look at it from the embodied cultural beliefs in a thing, you sometimes come up with really interesting things, sort of insights into your own life. I think that phone notification noise that went off was oddly appropriate. While yeah. You were talking uh, about that. Well, in, in, indeed, you know, because it's the, the, a mobile phone has a really interesting embodied uh, cultural belief in it, which is that previously a telephone number was a place you called my house or you called my desk. You and if I wasn't there, there. Yeah. I, I might not be there, right? But the phone, you know, the phone's ringing. I'm just, all that signifies is I'm not there. Now, however, because a phone number signifies a person and culturally the assumption is that, that person will have their phone with them at all times and on at all times then we end up with all sorts of new cultural assumptions, which is that if you ring my phone and I don't pick it up, then it means I don't like you anymore, or I'm doing something, or you know, I'm doing something suspicious, or whatever it is. And so there are these cultural assumptions in technology that, we, that sometimes we don't interrogate, we don't question, and we don't even notice, but which are, do have a, a fundamental effect on the way that we coexist with that tech. You mentioned earlier that it's impossible to empathize with everyone everywhere, with all the contexts that are not ours, which is totally true, and we should try, and we all work in, well, most of us work in teams now, 
So if we have more diversity in our teams, then we're better able to imagine more different contexts. So does that make it kind of like we have an ethical responsibility to the world to aim for diversity so we can do a better job at understanding the consequences of what we make? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, I think so. Uh, and, and I think and, and what you define by diversity is also very important here because we're not just talking about sort of ethnic or, or gender diversity, but just the ability to see how that sort of how the technology you're, you're developing would affect different people of different lifestyles or, or, you know, different social positions and different social privileges and so on. Now, of course, there does come a point where you just basically have to, like, choose something. And, you know, it's, it's not fair on me to call on, say, the guy writing email client on BlackBerry's to n not create e an email client on the BlackBerry which wasn't email centric. You know, it's not, it's not fair on that person. But what BlackBerry have to do is sort of acknowledge that their device is not a device for, you know, their device does have that cultural assumption. Or they could build in features like do not disturb between certain hours. They could do that, or they, you know, they could choose to do that, or they could choose to just simplify and just say, this is the device for people who really want to be on top of their email. You know, if you don't want to be on top of your email, don't go with it. And they could, they could be radically simple in that way. And that may be more successful for them. Who knows? But, I mean, they couldn't be any less successful, so, you know, rock on. But <laughs> we, it, it's just being aware of it that I think is the, the most important thing. I, I don't think it's necessary to necessarily have a, you know, a quota system or something like that. I like what you said about diversity. It's not a gender and ethnicity are clues, but really it's about a diversity of contexts and a diversity of understanding how the world works in places that we don't live. We can build that within ourselves by seeking out new experiences. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. And it's, it's a habit that once you, you start getting into, it actually becomes sort of addictive, I think. Just that sort of... The ability to, or the habit of looking at something and saying, well, you know, how would this go down if I wasn't me, if I was a young single mother or a, you know, a quasi retiree or somebody in the third world or somebody, you know, somebody in Paris trying to run their kids to school or somebody in, you know, stuck in the traffic in Los Angeles or whatever it is. If you, if you try and run it through all those sorts of different scenarios, then that actually becomes quite addictive to do. And it also becomes very useful, I think, from a design point of view that ability to empathize actually makes you a better designer, makes you a better coder, makes you a better you know, maker of things because you're making stuff that is much more nuanced and more finely tuned by usage, even if that usage is only in your head with you know, imaginary people. That's beautiful. Well, I don't know if it's beautiful. I just think it's sort of necessary in this day and age that if we are trying to write software or create services which are run on a global platform then they are going to be used by people around the world or you can choose to just make something that is only going to be very local and very specialized but as long as you're honest about that in your own head then that's cool too but if you're making something that you think is going to be a global release and you want it to be globally used then you have to be aware of the different contexts that it's going to be it's going to be used in and also, it also enables you to take criticism in a way. You know, you should never read the comments anyway, right? But if you read the comments in, or the reviews in the Apple App Store, for example, almost universally, those reviews are written from the point of view of the reviewer thinking the universe revolves around them, almost without 100%. You know, certainly all the one-star reviews, apart from the apps that are actually, genuinely are objectively rubbish, but the, most of the one-star reviews have actually quite good apps the one-star reviews come from people who are saying, this application is terrible because it didn't do the thing that I wanted it to do for my life. Like the and guy that, at the GCHQ who's upset about encryption on the phones because he thinks everything is about the GCHQ. Right, exactly that, exactly that. You know, anything that, that, that Google does is obviously about American or re British national security. And of course, Google and Apple are looking at it going, um, no, actually, our biggest market is China. And, you know, our biggest growth market is Africa. And actually, you know, the United States and Northern Europe are really not our most important market, nor are where we're thinking about most. And that, that is going to be a really interesting shift in technology in the next 10 years, I think, is the fact that the majority of technological development is going to happen, not necessarily in Asia, but is going to be directed towards Asia. 
and your Californian geek, as we're seeing now with, with young male teenage gamers in the whole Gamergate thing, that are all going to start feeling really left out by the industry that, that previously had been dedicated to servicing them as their first and most important customers. And what we're going to start seeing soon is that the first and most important customers are actually 30-something women in the center of China rather than 20-something guys in metropolitan North America. And that's going to be a big shock for everyone. I mean, people are going to start to really be upset when the laptops get smaller and curvier and, you know, pink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be different. That's a really interesting thought. That's going to change yeah, a lot of it's, things. Yeah, it's, it's going to change a lot of things. And it's the same, it's not just in sort of personal technology. It's in, it's in silly things like architecture and not, not so much architecture, but interior uh, fittings. If you're a company that's making, say, bathroom fittings, then the vast majority of bathroom fittings in the world are going to be bought in China because of all of the cities and all of the, their building, all of the urbanization that's happening there. And so, the vast majority of bathroom fittings are going to be made for the Chinese market. And so we're going to start to see, say, Chinese interior decorating tastes come into the market in a much heavier than we previously wouldn't, uh, previously were used to. Things are going to get weird in that way because the dominant aesthetic isn't going to be of the American middle class. The dominant aesthetic is going to be, say, the Chinese middle class, just because there's so many more of them. And there are only so many factories that make bathroom fittings or whatever it is that you're, that you're talking about. And so that's a real mindset shift. And again, the sort of more conservative people in North America and, and Northern Europe aren't going to take kindly to that because they have lived their entire life in a time when, you know, we're number one, right? And, well, we're not really anymore for an awful lot of things, certainly in terms of, say, consumer choice, something like that, where, you know, we're actually sort of middle of the road market. And so Apple is much more interested. The, you know, the iPhone 6 and iOS 8 are much more about, about Chinese users than they are about North American or Western European users. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, so here's a question that's sort of related to what I asked you earlier. When looking at the way things are moving, like you're just describing, are there some sources of information, news sources, or, or I mean, like, where do you look to get a better perspective on these trends? Because mo a lot of the, the news sources that I, tech news sources and others that I see are, you know, just very sort of, you know, they're very contextual, they're very sort of myopic, focused on people like me. Yeah, there are lots of news sources from different places. You know, f f Global Voices, for example, the pro project that's out of MIT, that's uh, Harvard even, sorry, part of the Berkman Center at Harvard. That's a very good resource for local news written in English about places, so you can get sort of interesting viewpoints. There are lots of blogs that cover Asian technology or something like that. But I think the most important thing is to look outside the industry as well. So... Although the vast majority of the work that I do is consulting in the effects of technology on society and those sorts of future trends, that is usually expressed not in personal computing or mobile to computing blogs, but is, is expressed in things like shop fitting magazines and, you know, interior decor and architecture magazines and, and general science publications and medicine and, and even things like, you know, big catalogs from department stores. There's a store here in the UK called Argos which publishes a, a very thick catalog that's maybe a thousand pages of products. Um, they do it every quarter, I think it is. It's sort of like a, imagine if, say, Target or Walmart published a catalog. Now, that's actually incredibly good reading to, um, to start to get a, an idea of the zeitgeist because it's all of the products you would never usually look at. So, for example, you know, all the toys you wouldn't look at if you don't have kids or all of the white goods you never look at if you, if you don't live in the suburbs. And it's the same thing. If you can pick up those sorts of things, but from other countries, you start to, you get, start to get an idea of how people are living and the things they most value that's outside of the usually quite minimalist, usually quite tech-centric sort of, you know, coda lifestyle. And once you can start to look at that, then you get an idea of, hey, actually, some of the things that we think are really, really commonplace are actually really, really rare. And some of the things that we think are banal and passe are actually incredibly commonplace and very, very popular. And you start to realize the real shape of, of the way that this sort of technology is taken up. That's fascinating. I feel like we've transitioned into picks. <laughs> Let's have Jessica go first. Jessica, what are your picks? I have one blog post that I'm completely fascinated by this week. It's by Peter Hinchins. It's called Children of the Fight. And it's about how some small percentage of the population doesn't experience empathy and how that was probably essential for the evolution of humor. It goes that far. It's really fascinating read. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes. That's cool. my pick. 
Avdi, what are your picks? I think just one today, and it's a hardware pick. I'm sure the listeners will never tire of listening to my uh, ongoing foray into ergonomic technologies. So uh, <laughs> with that in mind, I have been enjoying the MS Sculpt keyboard that I think I picked a few months ago. It's definitely an improvement over just a regular standard keyboard. But uh, I've still been getting a lot of a lot of pain. I've still got some some ulnar nerve issues going on. So I decided to go to the next phase, and I got myself a Kinesis Advantage keyboard after trying out a few different like crazy ergonomic keyboards. And I gotta say, it's in a completely different category than the Sculpt. Like the Sculpt is like okay, this is like a regular keyboard, only slightly less painful. The Kinesis is just kind of amazing. It's very very differently shaped, and it's deliberately shaped to not make your fingers move so much. And it's it's interesting, like, I'm still typing relatively slow compared to what I was typing on the, on the Sculpt, but every single time I make a typing mistake, I realize it's because I stretched a finger too far, and if I hadn't stretched so far, I actually would have hit the key that I wanted. So I, it's, it's really remarkable. I used a Kinesis for years, and they're wonderful. My favorite part is that prime real estate right by both your thumbs instead of being just one big space bar you've got like control and all yes. and a whole bunch of keys that you need to hit all the time i feel like the the people who designed the traditional keyboard imagine humans as having this gigantic prehensile pinky <laughs> and sort of <laughs> opposable pinkies i want one <laughs> pathetic stubs of thumbs that, that that can't do anything and and it's it's funny because if you know if you've ever used a video game system you know that like the thumb is the most important digit you have like you know most of the buttons and most of the controls are positioned for the thumb for a very good reason because thumbs are really useful so yeah that's the other thing i love about this is that it's a keyboard that actually acknowledges i own thumbs so yeah i mean it's it's not cheap it's like a 300 hundred dollar keyboard but it is totally worth it i'm really liking it and that's my pick for today so uh, this last weekend, my wife and I went out to Park City, Utah, which is up in the mountains. It's up where they have the Sundance Film Festival. So, you know, when that's going on, you're likely to see celebrities in Utah. Otherwise, you're probably not. But anyway, it's a really just great town. If you like to ski, it's a great place to go for that, too. But just a fun place to get away. In the summer, there's a lot of hiking and mountain biking and stuff that you can go do as well. And so I'm just going to pick a getting away, get away from the computer, get away from work and just go out and do something fun and Park City. I'm going to pick Park City because it's just, it was just a nice weekend to just, you know, go up and be close to nature. I don't know if we actually went into nature because it was cold and it snowed, but you know, it was a lot of fun. So anyway, those are my picks. Ben, what are your picks? So I'm going to pick a, another uh, series of podcasts actually, because I invented the word, so I'm allowed. I've been a huge fan over the past uh, few years of the podcast 99% Invisible, which is an amazing podcast about design and architecture and all the stuff that surrounds us. And a couple of years ago, Roman Mars, the guy who, who makes it, had a Kickstarter to sort of go from, I think, monthly to, to fortnightly. And then last year had another Kickstarter, which which funded the formation of a group of like-minded podcasts. And then recently, a couple of days ago, they finished another pod, uh, the Kickstarter where they raised over $600,000 to continue that series of podcasts and to add three more. And it's a group of podcasts called Radiotopia. And as somebody who makes radio and as somebody who listens to an awful lot of it, I have to say that this is all of my stunningly good uh, storytelling podcasts and, and absolutely well worth it. I mean, if you're into Design specifically, then 99% Invisible is, is absolutely brilliant. The latest episode of one of the other one of the other podcasts, which is called Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything, the latest episode has an interview with a writer about the internet, a man called Paul Ford, who is who is a huge hero of mine about in it, with his writings about the digital world. And so, I would thoroughly recommend all of the podcasts in, in Radiotopia and specifically 99% Invisible and anything that can can get its audience to give them over half a million dollars and, you know, additional funding year after year after year is, it's got to be worth it. So try those out. They're only about half an hour each, each one. Cool. They sound like a lot of fun. All right. Well, um, I don't think we have any announcements, so we'll go ahead and wrap up the show and we'll catch you on next week. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, 
We'll augment your team and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. This episode is sponsored by Ninefold. Ninefold provides solid infrastructure and easy setup and deployment for your Ruby and Rails applications. They make it easy to scale and provide guided help in migrating your application. Go sign up at ninefold.com. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor.